Tonight, an airline's contract dispute leaves some Canadian passengers high and dry. Why is there wasn't anyone there to talk to us, to tell us what was happening? Flair Airlines responds after losing access to four planes. A U.S. bank collapses, what it means for big markets and regular people. There are millions of employees with paychecks at stake next week. At just 19, she's one of the Juno Awards' most celebrated stars. Very quickly it changed and I suddenly had this really supportive fan base. My conversation with Tate McRae. This is The National with Ian Hennemansing. U.S. officials moved quickly today, wanting to stem any panic from spreading through the economy after the sudden collapse of a bank. The new actions bring relief for customers of Silicon Valley Bank. It failed on Friday after being unable to handle a run of withdrawals. Once worth $200 billion, it's now in the hands of federal regulators. Their assurances to customers after an uncertain weekend, they will get access to their money. Katie Simpson walks us through the new crisis measures and the potential ripple effects. Silicon Valley banks collapse set off a panic not seen since the days of the financial meltdown of 2008, triggering urgent calls for calm and extraordinary action. The American banking system is really um, safe and well capitalized. It's resilient. To limit the damage, federal officials announced customers who deposited money will be made whole. They will have access to their bank accounts as of Monday. The money will be repaid through a special assessment on banks, not by taxpayers. The Treasury Secretary hinted as much before specifics were announced. We are concerned about depositors and are focused on uh, trying to meet their needs. Thousands of small and medium-sized tech sector companies, the majority of SVB's customers, stood to lose billions of dollars in deposits when the bank failed on Friday. These are climate cut startups. These are startups that are helping cure cancer. Yeah. And they're employing Americans across the country. And all their, they didn't take risks. They just had their money in a bank. The failure caused massive uncertainty in the markets, with billions of dollars lost, including a huge hit for Canadian banking stocks. It also led to pleas for the government to step in, amid fears employers who banked with SVB would not be able to pay workers. No one wants to miss a paycheck, right. and there are millions of employees with paychecks at stake next week. And fears inaction would lead to a run on more smaller regional banks. If people get nervous, they may start taking their money out of those banks and putting it into the large money center banks. We don't want further consolidation. And Katie, federal regulators and officials are also putting in similar measures for a second bank. Yeah, it's called Signature Bank, Ian, and it's a major player in the world of cryptocurrency. Authorities are doing what they can to ensure there is confidence in the banking system and confidence in markets. President Joe Biden will speak about this on Monday, but he put out a statement today saying that the people responsible for this mess will be held accountable. And he called for strengthening oversight and regulation of larger banks so that this doesn't happen again. He hopes he'll be able to calm fears. And in the meantime, federal officials are looking closely for any early signs of stability. Ian. Katie Simpson in Washington tonight. Thank you. Some March break travelers were left scrambling to get to their destinations after several Flair Airlines planes were seized by the company it leases them from. As Lisa Shing explains, today the airline CEO is hitting back. A March break trip to Disneyland started with a big delay for Laura Pomeroy's family. What I don't understand, why is there wasn't anyone there to talk to us, to tell us what was happening. On Saturday morning, they were supposed to fly with Flair Airlines from Toronto's Pearson Airport to California. That flight was cancelled and rebooked. And my but for the following week. Super not useful for us in our March break vacation. So they bought their own flights with another carrier to leave sooner. Absolutely panic-stricken. As did Nick Pulamenos, who almost didn't make a conference in Miami. His flight from Waterloo, Ontario, was abruptly cancelled also on Saturday. His messages to the airline unanswered. I have an extremely high amount of anxiety right now. I'm panicking. Can you get back to me? And, you know, crickets didn't hear a thing. 
Flair Airlines says four of its leased airplanes were seized in Toronto, Edmonton and Waterloo in what it calls a commercial dispute. The company was five days late on its million dollar payment to New York based hedge fund Airborne Capital. This happened in the dark of night on a spring break weekend when they knew that our passenger loads would be absolutely heaving and full. Flair's CEO says it was in talks with Airborne to pay by Monday and insists the company is not in trouble financially. It's an underhanded move and was completely unwarranted. Airborne did not respond to CBC's requests for a comment, but experts say seizing a fifth of Flair's planes is likely supposed to send a message. Do not mess around with paying for your airplanes because we have a market. And, you know, the, the market for leasing airplanes these days uh, is tight. Lisa, a lot of passengers must be wondering, what does the future hold for Flair? Yeah, and that's one of the questions that I put to Flair Airlines CEO, Ian, and he told me they are a startup, that wintertime can be tough for airlines, but uh, it's in good financial standing and it's not going anywhere anytime soon. Now, in fact, they have actually added three aircraft that it was planning on bringing uh, online in the summer uh, today, actually, and one more will be up and running by tomorrow. So uh, the company says don't expect any more cancellations as a result of this issue. But the question now, Ian, is whether or not uh, these cancellations and the lack of communication will affect passengers' trust going forward in the airline. All right, Lisa, thank you. The company behind Facebook and Instagram is now threatening to drop news from your feeds if the Canadian government passes a controversial bill. It would force big tech platforms to strike funding deals with some news outlets. Sarah Levitt spoke with both supporters and critics. Large platforms can bully national legislatures. And Google and Meta are going too far, Liberal MP Anthony Housefather says, in their attempt to sway Canadian legislation. We need to find a way when the vast majority of advertising in Canada has been moved away from newspapers to Google and to Meta to have them pay back into Canadian journalism. The Online News Act, or Bill C-18, would force tech companies to negotiate compensation with news organizations for linking to their work. Instead, Meta, which owns Facebook and Instagram, now says it will block news content on its platforms if the bill is passed. It is the most extreme nuclear option. They are deeply concerned about this model, not as it plays out in Canada, but as it will almost certainly play out internationally if the Canadian model is seen as a success. Google is feeling that same stress. We have been transparent about our concerns with Bill C C-18. The head of Google Canada tussled with MPs before the Heritage Committee on Friday over tests which prevent some Canadians from seeing news links on the search engine. At the heart of all this, critics say, is a bill misguided in its attempt to help media. I think it undermines independence of the media. So I don't think that at the end of the day we're going to see a lot of money flow to the smaller independent media outlets that oftentimes need support. Others, though, say a power imbalance exists now. Most major media companies already have deals with Meta and Google. The Gabriola Sounder, which is Gabriola Island, which is an island off of Vancouver Island, they don't have a deal and they should get a deal. They're every bit as important to their readers as the Toronto Star is to people in Toronto. He says C-18 might get them that deal. The bill is now awaiting its second reading in the Senate, and if passed, could be law as soon as June. Sarah Levitt, CBC News, Montreal. California is bracing for yet another atmospheric river. The 11th this winter is expected Monday. That should mean more heavy rain for an area that can't take much more. This next storm will arrive on the heels of the one that caused so much catastrophic flooding across northern and central California this weekend. In hard-hit Monterey County, the Pajaro River breached a levee, sending a wall of water into a nearby town in the dead of the night, setting off a door-to-door -door scramble to get people out. They started evacuating, I think, at 12 in the morning or 1 in the morning, and they just started, the National Guards are just taking people out as they go. Dozens needed to be rescued after getting caught in the rising water. Now the race is on to clean up the damage and prepare as much as possible for the next direct hit. In Israel, public outrage keeps growing over proposed laws that would give the government more control over the judiciary. 
Chris Brown shows us what critics say is at stake during the 10th straight week of protests that have reached an enormous scale. Opponents of Israel's hard right leaning government staged perhaps the largest protest the country has ever seen, especially in Tel Aviv. But what impact they will have is hard to discern. I'm really afraid for my future, the future of my kids, so we, we plan to move from here. The proposed changes to Israel's Supreme Court would make it easier for the government to appoint friendly judges and to override decisions it doesn't like. Dmitry Sherikov says he watched as Russia's Vladimir Putin did exactly the same thing. I knew all my life I saw how democracy uh, fall, how democracy lose. Some law and order heavy hitters agree, including a former Israeli police commissioner. You want to uh, control uh, the Israel police who, to make it a political uh, police. Uh, and we are uh, to say it, enough is enough. The country's high-tech driven economy has been battered by the fallout. Credit rating agencies are worried and IT money is already fleeing. But as Israel's cabinet met Sunday, there was not a hint of bending from Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. What the opposition cares about is not judicial reform, but creating anarchy to topple the elected government, he said. Some portion of this will go through and it will be a significant portion. This political analyst says the protests don't concern the governing coalition's most extreme members. It is the culmination of an aim that the right-wing forces in Israel have wanted for a long time because they want to advance an agenda that violates liberal and democratic principles. They want to advance annexation. Absent from the judicial debate are Palestinians in the occupied West Bank, most of whom don't think Israeli democracy protects them anyway. Violence involving Israeli settlers and security forces has spiked, with three more young Palestinian men killed near Nablus overnight by Israeli soldiers after they fired automatic weapons at an outpost, according to Israel's military. It's no secret Israel's government wants to increase settlements in the West Bank. It's moving fast to get its judicial reforms in place to facilitate that, which could pass within weeks. Chris Brown, CBC News, Jerusalem. Indian Supreme Court will begin hearing a challenge to the country's ban on same-sex marriage. Like much of Asia, India has not adopted marriage equality laws at the pace of Western nations. The Indian government has urged the Supreme Court to uphold the ban. The country decriminalized homosexuality in 2018. Ukraine is continuing to push its Western allies for fighter jets, desperate to improve its air defense. Marina von Stackelberg shows why its leadership might have reason for hope. Ukraine says that in the last week, 1,100 Russian soldiers have been killed in battles near the eastern city of Bakhmut. Fighting on both sides is expected to intensify. The stalemate brought on by winter is starting to thaw. In recent days, Russia launched a new wave of airstrikes aimed at knocking out Ukraine's infrastructure and power grid. The uh, fighter jets uh, issue is uh, difficult. Ukraine's president wants fighter jets from the West. I think those, I think F-16s will be provided. Uh, uh, it's hard to know exactly when, but I think they're coming. On Rosemary Barton Live, a former top U.S. soldier says Ukraine's biggest vulnerability right now is the sky above it. If I were going to pick one area where they really need to uh, make sure they are as advanced as they can possibly be, it's, it, it's in air defense and getting all those systems in place to counter some of the kinds of attacks uh, that occurred uh, in the last uh, day or so. On the ground, the Canadian military continues to show Ukrainian soldiers how to use advanced tanks. The next few months are going to be extremely critical in generating combat power for both Ukraine and Russia to try to gain the upper hand as the weather changes. The leader of the opposition says Ottawa needs to focus on arming Ukrainian soldiers. The problem with this government is they, uh, they, they, it's not that they don't spend enough, it's that they don't achieve enough results for the spending they do. They spend too much on back office bureaucracy and not enough on frontline military equipment. Canada has spent more than $1 billion in military aid for Ukraine. That includes eight Leopard 2 tanks soon on their way to the front line. Marina von Stackelberg, CBC News, Ottawa. 
A lot of angry television sports fans in the UK this weekend. The BBC's suspension of a high-profile soccer broadcaster has caused confusion for its biggest shows. I'm going to walk my dog and I'm going to do my shopping, so would you mind letting me do it on my own? That is soccer announcer Gary Lineker. Two days after the BBC suspended him, Lineker had tweeted his opposition to Britain's new migration policy, calling it immeasurably cruel and comparing it to Germany in the 30s. Those comments lit up British media and got him removed from his hit soccer show Match of the Day for violating impartiality rules. It's difficult. It's this balance between free speech and impartiality. The trouble for the BBC is that other hosts then walked out in support of Lineker. It had to cancel and shorten sports programming this weekend. Now it's scrambling to sort things out. We are working very hard um, to resolve the situation and make sure that we get output back on air. As to Lineker's comments, here's some reaction. Well, I think you have to take things into context and I don't think he's really done that. You should be allowed to have free speech. He's, he's not, on his post, he's not referenced matter of day or anything like that. A New York City mental health initiative that allows for involuntary hospitalizations continues to raise concerns tonight. As Chris Reyes shows us, frontline workers worry it could be doing more harm than good. A mental health crisis in plain sight. It almost goes unnoticed until it all goes wrong. A random attack, a public breakdown. EMS call volume. Longtime New York paramedic and union so, VP Anthony Almagera sees it in his work every day. Somebody's got to call 911 for the mental health episodes and, and urgency and, and, and crisis that's happening here. The city's mayor has stepped up with an ambitious mental health plan. But one policy in particular has raised concerns. This directive lays out an expedited step-by-step -step process for involuntarily transporting a person experiencing a mental health crisis to a hospital for evaluation. That announcement in November sparked protests. Out of sight, out of mind. Out of sight, out of mind is a publicity stunt and is not public safety. Now, mayors in California are also exploring a similar policy. It is horrifying. Arvind Siknanan was forced into hospital as a teenager. He says it's the wrong solution. While it is, comes from a good place, um, I, I do think that, A, police responding uh, to someone in a mental health crisis is never a good thing. Almagera says the policy is flawed. He's taken people to hospital before, only to have them back out on the street on the same day. It's not even a Band-Aid. Band-Aids stop bleeding. Homeless people in Adams has pushed back on critics and clarified his new directive. That is not the entire population. That's a small, targeted group. And it was inhumane to allow them to stay on the streets without proper care. Suknanan and Almagera, both on the front lines, have this message. You need places for these people to go while they start to put the pieces of their life back together. So if it's long-term inpatient psychiatric hospitals, we need to get those back. We need recovery models that really restore the autonomy and dignity of people with serious mental illness. On that, the mayor has pleaded for patience. I didn't become mayor to climb a hill. I became mayor to climb a mountain. This is a mountain that I'm climbing. A city watching and waiting for lasting change. Chris Reyes, CBC News, New York. Canadians are competing in some of the major categories at tonight's Academy Awards. Are you kidding me? Yes. She really only tells me things about you. We are creating a coalition to fight this regime. And we've liberated ourselves. We're at the Dolby Theater with all the glitz and glamour. Edmonton's Tate McRae is about to hit a different red carpet. The rising star is up for the Junos for her very first album. I feel like I just like watch myself grow up in songs. And a community springs to action to save a pot of dolphins. I took turns like a mother, lifting one on one side and one on the other and clearing the ice off their blowhole so that they could breathe. We're back in two.
Sacrifice from Toronto's The Weeknd. He won four Juno Saturday, including Artist of the Year and Single of the Year. For that one, he beat out rising star Tate McRae and her hit, She's All I Want to Be. But McRae still in contention for two other Junos on the broadcast tomorrow night, right here on CBC. She once again will be up against The Weeknd, but whatever happens, at just 19 years old, McRae is on a roll. A music career that was launched from her home in Calgary with this video. What's up guys, it's Tate here, and today I'm doing something really exciting for me. It's impossible to get you off my mind. Calgary's Tate McRae posted this video five years ago when she was just 13. She was literally an overnight success, and within weeks, the record companies came calling. Her biggest hit, You Broke Me First, has more than one billion streams on Spotify. And Tay McCray joins us now tonight from Edmonton, where the Junos are being celebrated throughout the weekend. Uh, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. What's it like being in Edmonton for the Junos? So exciting. It's so great to be back home. I mean, I'm obviously so honored to be amongst so many incredible Canadian artists, so it feels very cool to be back. We played just a few seconds of, of your biggest hit, You Broke Me First. Uh, it, you know, it did so well on every platform from radio to Spotify to YouTube. What impact has it had on your career? Oh, I mean, it kind of changed my life. I wrote it when I was 16 at the beginning of the pandemic. And, you know, I feel like music wasn't really something that I knew I was going to end up doing for my life. Um, and very quickly it changed. And I suddenly had this really supportive fan base and continued to write and continued to go on with my career and move out to L.A. And it's been very exciting since then. You've written a lot of songs and performed a lot of songs since then and still continue to get a lot of streams and views on Spotify and, and YouTube. One of those songs nominated for single of the year, She's All I Want to Be. We're going to listen to a little bit of that now. So Tate, what should we know about that song? Uh, well, I wrote that song last year. It was one of the first singles off of my debut album. Um, I mean, I, I think all my music is a really genuine and vulnerable side of me. I feel like that's where I express all my, my deepest emotions. And that song was a super scary song to write. It was about jealousy and comparison and the effects of social media on young minds. And uh, I feel like it got translated. Like I was in a really fragile state and it got translated into a really empowering song which is so exciting to see and I think that's because music is up for interpretation all the time and uh, it's been a really really cool time performing that on tour this year and seeing how it reacts in a live crowd too. So obviously you're a singer you're a performer but you were also nominated to the Junos for for songwriter of the year uh, tell me about that part of your your creative process. I mean I've been writing songs in my bedroom since I was 13 years old I think I'm just a very creative person. I have a lot to say. Um, and so I feel like I constantly have the need to write it down and get it into songs. And um, it's just exciting. I feel like I'm documenting my entire life as I'm growing up. I'm 19 now. And, you know, I feel like I just like watch myself grow up in songs. And it's it's really crazy because you realize how many people live very similar lives and thoughts as you. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's a it's a very therapeutic way for me to live my life is just making sure I jot and, and get everything into music. And, and tell me a little bit more about, about even the songwriting process these days, because I'm old enough that I remember a time when it would be one artist. So you'd sit down, write their songs. Maybe it's two that would collaborate. Now I see songwriting credits for a lot of pop songs and it'll be three or four or five people. And I think that's been the case, at least in, in some of your songs. How does that work? I mean, honestly, I write my best music by myself. Um, and I think that's like shown in all my biggest music is usually just me and a producer. I think it's because you get the most real stuff. But yeah, I mean, sessions are crazy now. I feel like there's so many situations where you'll see like four producers, three top liners, a, an artist, and it's 
just a very collaborative process. I mean, everyone's different, but I, I definitely do like writing on my own most of the time. Uh, you, you have a lot of talents and, uh, and, and, I mean, your fans know this, but not everyone watching knows this. Maybe your first major recognition that you gained was as a dancer on So You Think You Can Dance, and Paula Abdul, former dancer, former, and mm -hmm. I guess a pop star, um, had some remarkable words describing you. We're just going to play a little bit of that. That was perfection, and I mean that. Watching you move, it's like a ripple effect, like, like in a lake, and the water just ripples. There's no beginning, there's no middle, there's no end. It is seamless. From start to finish, you are a gift from God. Thank you you so are a much. gift from God. Thank you. Wow. Now, you're not <laughs> old enough to really fully maybe appreciate Paula Abdul, like, like a big star. Um, what was it like to have her say that to you? I mean, it was so crazy. I was 12, 13 at the time. Um, <laughs> I think it was more of a shock. I mean, I'm just a really, I spent so much of my life in my own bubble by myself, just like training and dancing because I loved it so much. And I didn't don't even think I realized like how much time I put on put in when I was that young. I just feel like I was constantly like wanting to do better. Um, but that was definitely one of those validating moments where I was like, oh, wow, a huge icon like this is recognizing me in a way that I could, you know, never even imagine. It was just a big confidence booster. And I mean, definitely carried with me for a long time. So what's immediately next for you, of course, are the Junos, which are tomorrow night on CBC. You're mm -hmm. going to be performing and, and up for a couple of the five awards that you've been nominated for. Uh, but beyond that, I mean, you're you're incredibly talented, but you're also in an incredibly competitive field, you know, pop music. What's next for you after tomorrow's done? Um, well, obviously the performance, which I'm excited for, and then... I'm just been in the studio every single day writing. I think all you can do is keep pushing yourself to make better music um, and just keep creating something different, something new for your fans. And um, yeah, I think it's really exciting. I feel like I'm in a really refreshed state of mind and I feel like I have a lot of clarity on where I wanna go next in my music, which is really exciting. Um, so I can't wait to start creating and putting everything into videos and music and seeing it come to life. Well, there are lots of great videos out there. People can easily find them and it's been a pleasure listening to your work and, and really nice talking to you tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Same here. And you can see the Juno Awards tomorrow night right here on CBC, hosted by Simu Liu. It all kicks off live from Edmonton at 8 p.m. Eastern. In Los Angeles, the stars have walked the now proverbial red carpet and winners have been picked. Mrs. Wang, are you with us? Eli Glasner is at the Dolby Theatre watching it all unfold. But first... I feel very strongly that you are a perfect match for this company. Thank you. Thank you. Ukrainians fleeing the war are finding not only safety in Manitoba, but a province desperate for workers. What we really didn't know is how much Canada really needed Ukrainians. The National takes you deeper into the story shaping your world. Next. Since Russia invaded their country just over a year ago, tens of thousands of Ukrainians have come to Canada, many to Manitoba, where they're helping ease a chronic labor shortage. McPurden went to Winnipeg to see how that's working. Thank you for coming. It's been a while since we saw each other. Ukrainians are coming to Canada for help. We step up and we're helping them. But what we really didn't know is how much Canada really needed Ukrainians. Dobra, we'll send your resume. Since the war started a year ago, more than 150,000 Ukrainians have come to Canada, many of them here to Winnipeg. Now, the people here have gone out of their way to welcome the newcomers. But what I want to know is what their arrival has meant for Canada. Oh, I've been some. The first Ukrainian I meet is Konstantin Rolik. He got a job at this construction site. Konstantin fled the war with his family a few months ago. So I'm, I'm a musician, I play saxophone. I used to work on cruise ships on, for American company. I worked there 10 years, that's my career. 
Constantine had never worked construction before, but he needed to do whatever he could to help his family. Uh, the job here, uh, the chance to start new life again. I don't know, it's a new step in my life. We'll see also <laughs> how it's gonna work. For Constantine, this job means he can survive in a new country. For his foreman, Filippo Rizzuto, the stakes are high as well. Well, in the last few years, we had a uh, labor shortage here in Winnipeg with, with trades, working on crews that are, you know, uh, should be about 25, where we were down to about, you know, eight to nine guys, eight to nine workers. And that's hard to, to, to work on a site like this, the size of this building, the crew like that, because there's a lot of work here. There's lots to do here. John Garcia owns this company, one of the biggest construction companies in Manitoba. And he tells me the labor shortage has meant losing money. We were given projects to, that we could have started, and just because of shortage of labor, I wouldn't be able to promise you the finish date or the start date, so I'd have to give a contract back. But John tells me because of the Ukrainians he's hired, things are getting better. Well, it's, it's saddened that they had to be forced to come to Canada and into Manitoba because of a war, but it feels good as in a, to employ them here in Manitoba because yeah. we would never had you know, a chance in, in, in a short period of time yeah. to employ 50 people to actually come and willing to train and work in our field. 50 Ukrainians who've just fled war helping this company thrive, all in positions John says the company has tried to fill for years. We always worry about our locals first and our, our people, but if they're not there, what are you supposed to do? This construction company is not the only company hiring Ukrainians to fix their labor shortages. So we have your resume here, and uh, yeah. we found you a match. This office at the Ukrainian Canadian Congress in Winnipeg has been turned into a kind of employment agency. Kathy Landigo runs things. She's placed hundreds of newly arrived Ukrainians in jobs that Manitoba businesses have been trying to fill for years. I feel very strongly that you are a perfect match for this company. Thank you, thank you. Kathy recently retired, and now she volunteers here 50 hours a week. And she has a personal reason to help. Her grandfather came to Canada from Ukraine 90 years ago, fleeing Russian occupation. I think of my grandfather every day the stories of him coming to Canada on a ship with nothing but the clothes on his back and one suitcase. And that's what drives me every day to come here and volunteer. Hello, good How can I help you? 75 Ukrainian families Hi, arrive in Winnipeg you? each week and people need work. Yes, please come. Maria, what is your last name? I want to bring up your resume if you don't oh, mind. Maria because of the shortage of nurses in Manitoba, <laughs> Kathy was able to get Maria fast-tracked into a training program. Is, uh, so you're waiting for the nurses program, but you're looking yes. to find something right now, yes, right? Yes, you know, like a survival job, something like uh, this. I'm dreaming <laughs> that um, I can be uh, a certified nurse, that I can work here, I can help people, I can be useful, you know, I can be useful uh, to this city. Can I you? <laughs> yes, you can hug me. Of course you can. Maria tells me she thinks she'll stay in Canada even after the war is Thank over. You. Thank, Thank you for coming to Manitoba. Thank you. Winnipeg, and Manitoba for that matter, have one of the highest populations of Ukrainians outside of Ukraine. And people here keep telling me if I want to know what life is like for Ukrainians here, I need to go to this butcher shop, which has become a kind of community hub over the years. That's what we do. You need your receipt. Manager Daria Zuzulia and many other Ukrainians came to Canada in 2014 when Russia invaded Crimea. She says she can't believe the current conflict has already lasted a year. A year, it's a long time. Lots of deaths, lots of tragedy, lots of loss. So we just hope and pray that it will end sooner than later and less people will just die. The war has meant a new wave of Ukrainians coming to the butcher shop. And Daria has hired 10 of them. But here's the thing, she's not just helping them, she needs them. Now with all these Ukrainians that came, we are fully stuffed. It's never been, I think in the last 10 years, we've never been that fully stuffed like we are right now. One of the new hires Daria made is Irina Kopai. 
But she came in, put her resume, and like, I need a job now. I'm ready to start tomorrow. I want to work. I need work. I'm able to work. All this. Like, okay. Like that. Come tomorrow. And she started. 47. Irina was a teacher in Ukraine. She and her husband and their seven kids barely made it out of the country alive. Here at the butcher shop, Irina not only found a job, but a place where she belongs and a friend in Daria. Daria, she is amazing. <laughs> she helped us, she really helped us. And not like manager, not like boss, like friends. Daria is our friends. Now my family have normal life. I'm working, my children go to school. We don't have a lot of money, but we have enough for living. In just a few months, Irina and many other Ukrainians have gone from fleeing war to having a future again and helping Canada along the way. Nick Purden, CBC News, Winnipeg. Since the early days of the war, the Canadian government has offered Ukrainians and their families temporary resident visas. As of last month, the program had received close to 900,000 applications. And so far, two-thirds of them have been approved. If you're feeling a little bit off today, the time change may be to blame. I don't like it. <laughs> we don't, we're not farmers here in the cities. With all the talk to stop the clock, why do we keep changing? But first. Everything, everywhere, all at once is the one to beat at this year's Oscars. Will they sweep the awards? Eli Glasner is watching. Eli Glasner joins us. Uh, he was at the Oscars tonight, and Eli, quite a night for Canadians. An amazing night for Canadians, I think one of the strongest in recent memory, Ian. Let us begin with Sarah Polly uh, taking that novel by Miriam Taves and adapting it into her own film and taking home the Oscar for Best Adapted Screenplay and making a point to uh, talk to the Academy. No nominations for female directors these year, this year and a, a lot of teasing going on about a movie called Women Talking. And, that was an extraordinary speech she gave, obviously not off a teleprompter and just from the heart. Um, let's talk now about the big winner. The big winner is Everything Everywhere All at Once, going home with seven Oscars, including the biggest Oscar of them all, Best Picture. You could see the surprise on the directing duo known as the Daniels. And also Michelle Yeoh making history as the first Asian actor born in Malaysia, raised in Hong Kong, to take home Best Actress for her performance as Evelyn. She saying that this award is for the boys and and girls saying to the audience, don't let anyone tell you you are past your prime. Also, her co-star, Kihi Kwan, an emotional uh, acceptance speech for Best Supporting Actor, talking about being an immigrant, talking about being a refugee, saying this is the American dream, holding up his trophy. Even Jamie Lee Curtis, part of that cast, uh, winning for Best Supporting Actress, beating out Angela Bassett. So, so many awards for Everything Everywhere, which kind of was a movie for everyone. It had an amazing story about an immigrant family. It had special effects and a multitude of multiverses and now a, a multitude of awards, Ian. I don't know how much time we have left, but let me ask you about the other Canadians besides Sarah Pauly who won Oscars tonight. Many. I mean, there are so many. Uh, let's begin with uh, Daniel Rowe. He is the director of Navalny. This is a remarkable documentary about Alexei Navalny, who currently sits in prison. He was talking about the, the dire connection, conditions that the uh, Russian opposition leader finds himself in now. It's also a documentary where this Canadian director managed to record a phone call where the man who poisoned Navalny and organized that confessed 
for 50 minutes at length. And Daniel Rohr telling us in the press room he could tell they had something when his producer's jaw essentially fell on the ground. On top of that, we had Adrian Moreau, who did the prosthetics for The Whale. He is a makeup artist from Montreal. And we can't leave out Brendan Fraser, who has talked about, speaking of whales, being the high seas and low seas of his life in Hollywood, disappearing from view and then returning in his amazing performance as Charlie, someone really struggling with himself and his relationships. And he was emotional and just vibrating with joy tonight as he took home the award for best actor, one of many Canadian wins. Ian. So great to have you down there, Eli. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Coming up, a pod of dolphins trapped by sea ice and desperate for help. Seeing it, I mean, you can't help but have the compassion and try to do what you can do to save another life. How a Newfoundland community jumped in to save them. It's our moment. How did you feel when you woke up this morning? Daylight saving time has begun in most of Canada. As Stephanie Mercier shows us, the push is on to make this time change the last one. A cheery good morning from the steam clock in Vancouver. A reminder for many Sunday of that precious hour of sleep they lost in the night. Welcome to daylight saving time. I don't like it. <laughs> I don't think it's good and I would prefer that it did not exist. I think it's unnecessary. We don't, we're not farmers here in the cities. The spring ahead change to our clocks has been happening for just over a century, adopted by many countries as a way to save energy. But more and more, people seem to feel like this. Honestly, I don't think we need it anymore. I think it's time to get rid of it. So hopefully we do soon. So will we? In Canada, it's up to each region to decide what to do with the clocks. Saskatchewan never bought in to the biannual switch, Yukon stopped changing the time in 2020. Both BC and Ontario passed legislation to end the change, but say they're waiting for the US to do it too. We're uh, going to work in partnership with uh, um, uh, the United States, in particular the states down the western coast, as well as uh, the Yukon, to make sure that we move uh, in sync. Economists agree sticking with the US is important. And it's not just the computer systems and things like that, it's just the way people think and, and talk and uh, and I think if we if we do this out of sync, um, Canada does this out of sync from the U.S., that would have a meaningful economic impact. But many in the U.S. are ready to make the leap. Good Last week, we Senator Marco Rubio reintroduced a bill to eliminate the change, although it has failed several times before. The problem is it takes coordination between state and federal government in the U.S., uh, and that, of course, takes uh, much longer to accomplish uh, but since everyone wants it, I'm optimistic. For now, though, many just have to go along with the change, unless it seems you're Vancouver's beloved steam clock, which appeared to have skipped the switch. Stephanie Mercier, CBC News, Vancouver. This was a scene Friday morning in Heart's Delight, Newfoundland. A pod of dolphins helplessly pressed against rocks and ice. That's when people jumped into the frigid waters, dragging the injured animals to shore and then moving them back to open water. Their compassion is our moment. I mean, you can't help but have the compassion and try to do what you can do to save another life. The animals get wounded when they come into shore like that and get beaten up against rocks and that Arctic ice is pretty bad. You hear them making sounds that uh, just like cries for help. Of course things. So everyone just went into action. There were so many of us. There were guys driving ATVs. There were guys out in the water. So it was definitely a community effort. <laughs> so I got in there like a mother, lifting one on one side and one on the other and clearing the ice off their blowhole so that they could breathe. I had to take them and walk them one by one up through the water and bring them to the guys so they could load them into the sleds. Holy, that was huge. I know that we saved 12. I mean, we couldn't save them all. That's um, the sad thing about it. You just jump in and you help. I don't know how to explain it. It's just something we do. Right. 
really is extraordinary what they did dealing with the cold and the heavy lifting and just working away. Um, and they didn't just rescue those dolphins. They in, rescued them twice in the case of a couple of dolphins, got stuck again in the ice and then had to be put out to open waters, taken out to open waters. Also, if this all sounds familiar, I'd be thinking, what's up? 2018, the people of Heart's Delight did it again. That is the National for March 12th. Thank you for being with us. Have a good night.